Um, I have a garage there. Okay, or yeah, you can stay. But I'm not, like, sure if two year is due to go ahead just yet. Yeah, I think we're all, like, putting off the bachelorette party things. Okay, cool. Um. So you guys need to, like, bring it down a little bit. Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I know we're gonna be there at least three hours, so. Yeah. Okay. Cool. 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 Cool.
All right, it is 12 o'clock, so I think we should start because we don't want to be late, because you'll find out we're really sticklers for time, because we value your time. So welcome to Theorizing the Web 2016. We're really excited to have you here with us for two days of wonderful talks, panels, presentations, discussions, tweets. Um, on behalf of the committee, I want to welcome you all. I want to remind you that the buttons that you got at the registration desk are your tickets. You can't get into the museum without them unless you want to pay a fee. So keep keep uh, watch over your buttons. Bring them tomorrow. Um, we do want to draw your attention to um, our harassment statement, or anti-harassment statement. It is on our website. Please have a look, have a read. And if you have any questions or concerns, people with committee buttons like mine, find us. We're available. We're usually spread out around the conference venue. Talk to us. If you have any questions about anything at all, finding anything, just let us know. There are two sets of bathrooms. One is right around the corner here uh, to the left of room C. The other one is by the cloakroom and the registration desk in the lobby. Um, you're, of course, able to see the whole museum. If you haven't gone upstairs to see the exhibits, you're welcome to do it although you will have to leave your bags um, at the security desk in the cloakroom if you go upstairs. Uh, we do have a party tonight. We're calling it the after party, but it's actually the in-between party <laughs> because we have another day tomorrow. But we do have <laughs> pizza, pizza, drinks, and music tonight, so don't leave after the presentations are over. Come hang out with us. Um, we do want to ask you to not abuse the Wi-Fi because this is a public uh, Wi-Fi, so the bandwidth is limited, so please don't torrent videos or watch Daredevil or Jessica Jones or whatever it is you like to watch. <laughs> um, and the Wi-Fi information is available in the little booklets in the programs. Uh, it's the museum events, and the mommy events is the password. Um, please use the hashtags for the appropriate panels. If you're in room A, and this is room C, for instance, and we have panel one, this is C1. The next panel in this room will be C2, etc. So if you use uh, Twitter to ask questions or comment on things, please use both the TTW16 hashtag and the C1 hashtag or the other panel hashtags. <coughs> we do want to be very precise in particular with keeping time. So we ask the moderators to keep time and actually be very strict. And we ask the panel presenters to actually use those 12 minutes and not any more to give their presentations to leave time for discussions and questions and answers. And finally, we want to thank the Museum of Moving Image to giving, for giving us this wonderful space, uh, which I'm sure we will all use to the best uh, of our ability and enjoy over the next two days. Thank you, and Godspeed. Welcome to Theorizing the Web. Um, thank you. It's, uh Real, real pleasure to be here at Theorizing the Web on aboard the Starship uh, Enterprise, or Vo maybe it's Discovery. I, wh which is the, what's the name of the uh, ship from 2001? Discovery. Discovery. Uh, my name is Michael Connor. I'm Artistic Director of Rhizome, and it's my great pleasure to, uh, to be your moderator today for Hack the Planet, or should I say, Hack the Planet! <laughs> <laughs> we have some great papers coming up um, dealing with different topics, uh, touching on um, open source communities and um, blockchain politics and those sorts of things. Um, so before uh, we get started, just a couple of things. Each of the, um, each of the presenters are going to present for 12 minutes, and then after that we'll have a short time for Q&A. Uh, please take advantage of the hashtag, and uh, that's TTW16, and then C1. Uh, very catchy hashtags, but um, at least they're specific. Um, and so uh, we'll kind of check in with remote participants after the presentations have happened. I'm going to sit here in the front row, and I'm going to go like this. And that doesn't mean peace. It means you have two minutes left. <laughs> and, um, and I also want to say a big shout out to Nabil, who is our live stream producer, who's going to keep us um, on track. Nabil says that we have a room mic, so for q and I guess we don't need to pass the mic. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that when we get, get to it. Um, so now, uh, just to quickly introduce the presentations. Um, first, I'm going to run through all of them, and then um, each person will come up and, and say a couple words th of, um, when it's time for them to start. So the first will be Tyler Tracy with Materializing Crypto Anarchy. 
political economy at the intersection of 3D printing and digital piracy. Um, following Tyler, we'll have Brittany Fiore Gartland and R. Stuart Geiger with What the Hack? Hacking Culture and Discourse in Data Science Pedagogy. Good title. Second best title, maybe, of the lineup. Um, Brittany is unfortunately not here, so Stuart will be presenting. And this is um, my second opportunity to be at a panel with Stuart at the Arise on the Web. Um, Laura Narain will present Quitting Toxic Open Source Communities Towards a Theory of Disengagement Among Regular Open Source Contributors. And finally, we'll have Emma Stam with Block Party People Off the Bitcoin Chain. Um, so now, without further ado, it's time to hack the planet. <laughs> um, and let's get started with Tyler. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Tyler. I'm really excited to be here and a little bit nervous. I'm going to be honest about that. Um, I'm going to talk today about the descriptive vocabulary of crypto anarchy and its relevance for understanding political economic dynamics at the intersection of 3D printing and digital piracy. So, Tyler, yeah. you maybe take the microphone off the stand if you want to move around. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll try and be more or less sedentary. We're just saying to speak into it. can't hear you yeah. in the back is what he's saying. Oh, perfect. Good for the translation. Okay. Perfect. Is this better? Oh, my goodness. I can hear myself. I'm monitored. So uh, I want to start off with a quote here from Timothy C. May's Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. Uh, just as a seemingly minor invention like barbed wire made possible the fencing off of vast ranches and farms, thus altering forever the concepts of land and property rights in the frontier west, so too will the seemingly minor discovery out of an arcane branch of mathematics, cryptography, come to be the wire clippers which dismantle the barbed wire around intellectual property. Uh, to contextualize crypto-anarchism, we have to start off by talking about the cypherpunks. This was a group of programmers and cyber libertarians who were active in the late 80s, discussing, coding, and disseminating encryption uh, online. And uh, cryptography here refers to the writing and solving of codes and ciphers to enable secure communications between senders and recipients. Um, uh, Timothy C. May was a seminal cypherpunk and sort of the informal spokesperson for the group, and he coined the term crypto-anarchism to summarize the group's ideology. Anarchy here is used in a sort of morphological sense as without head uh, and doesn't really refer strictly to like Kropotkin or Goldman or, or uh, the, the anarchist canon. So I identify two senses of crypto-anarchy at use in May's writing, and these are going to be really helpful as heuristic devices. Uh, the first is as a technical structure, and we're referring here to decentralized networking environment where nodes, computers, or individuals employ cryptographic tools to communicate <coughs> anonymously. Uh, dark nets are a good example of this, but we will uh, look at some more on the next slide. Uh, May is also using crypto-anarchy to refer to a socio-technological complex that embodies the interactional spaces, toolkits, capacities, values, and identities entailing from these networks. Uh, restricted access websites on dark nets, public key encryption, uh, tax evasion, privacy and volunteerism, pseudonymity. These are the sorts of things that crypto-anarchy is engaging with. So 
to exemplify crypto anarchy here and look at some really direct correspondences to May's definition, we've got darknets, onion land comes to mind. This is the darknet that runs on the Tor browser. Um, Silk Road is a good example of a DNM or a crypto market. Uh, this was shut down a few years ago, but uh, others like Black Market Reloaded are still operating. Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, which I'm going to defer to the presenter who will be talking more in depth about that. Um, and then independent media platforms, WikiLeaks is the big name in this camp. These are good examples of crypto anarchies that correspond really directly to May's definition. But to precipitate, precipitate crypto anarchy, it's important to look at some baseline conditions that are always present. Uh, a decentralized social environment. For the cypherpunks, this was the early internet. The capacity for strong anonymity, uh, unbreakable crypto. And a perceived cost to surveillance. Uh, this could be principled as, uh, as with the violation of privacy or opposition to the censorship of free speech. Um, it could be tactical as with uh, the desire to evade law enforcement or for stigmatized and taboo communities to have private spaces for discussion. Note that you can have the first two without the third and crypto anarchy won't entail. So you really need to have a perceived cost to surveillance to drive people to use these sorts of networks. Um, I know we're probably wondering what this has to do with 3D printing. I've just got another theoretical maneuver to make and then we will get to that. Um, so I want to argue that the baseline conditions for crypto anarchy represent a deep structure that can't any longer account for its scope and agency solely. Um, so to borrow a term from linguistics here, deep structure, uh, and to reify this schema, I want to consider the evolution of illicit file sharing on the internet. So in, in the days of the early internet, in the early 90s, you had peers trading files, or FTP dir directly um, over peer-to-peer -peer networks, um, using strong anonymity. But soon, massification replaced the need for blanket anonymity. Uh, think Napster here. There were so many people on the networks torrenting and um, pirating media that law enforcement couldn't regulate. So while key players still needed strong anonymity, most users did not. Centralization was introduced into these networks to m efficiently manage data. Uh, websites like The Pirate Bay and ISO Hunt really embody this, um, this trend. And the role of encryption evolved with new protocols. Um, specifically, it was sort of internalized. So if you're using a protocol like BitTorrent to pirate media online, you might not realize that you're working directly with cryptography because it's internal to the protocol structure. Uh, let's compare this back to May's framework for crypto anarchy, and we can see that whereas darknets and Bitcoin look a lot like crypto anarchy, it's harder to see how illicit file sharing pertains. Uh, this is a really important maneuver to make before we can talk about 3D printing, because I'm going to argue that the intersection of 3D printing and digital piracy represents something that's more superficial to the deep structure, but still can be described as a modality of crypto anarchy. So digital piracy meet 3D printing. Uh, to make explicit some terms I'm using here, digital piracy is the distribution via computers of copyright or patented data objects without the lawful owner's consent. 3D printing is the construction of an item additively. This means from the ground up, and you do this by extruding or manipulating stock materials, usually plastics or soft metals. Um, and physibles are digital files that act as blueprints to be uploaded to a 3D printer. Really important to note here is that Anyone who pirates digital media can already pirate physibles. The infrastructure is already in place and websites like the Pirate Bay index physibles with their own category. Uh, the main restriction, in fact, is not infrastructural, it's technological. So today's 3D printers manufacture solid, architecturally simple objects like replacement parts, appliance casings, and certain medical devices. My exhibit A is fabricating prostheses. Over the past summer, I had the opportunity to meet uh, an individual who was 17 years old, amateur inventor, and had saved up enough money working odd jobs to buy their own 3D printer. They were using this to fabricate a prosthesis for their niece. So prosthetics are a good example of something that can be prohibitively expensive to buy from a corporate manufacturer, uh, but it's actually pretty easy to 3D print. Uh, and their game plan here was to take a prototype that the family already owned, scan it using a 3D scanner, which works kind of like the scanner on your traditional printer, um, it's, it's almost that easy. And then scale as the niece grew uh, and as the prostheses wore out uh, and reprint at the cost of raw materials. So obviously saving the family a lot of money over time. 
And this segues into materializing crypto anarchy. So this, this slide is sort of like a choose your own adventure crypto anarchy. Uh, and we can imagine playing off the anecdote that I just told. Uh, there's a number of ways to create a physical, but one is to scan an object directly with a 3D scanner. Uh, there's a number of ways to distribute them. We could collect them in data havens like Freenet, or we could index them on piracy platforms like uh, uh, the Pirate Bay. As far as materializing physicals, we could print them at home, like the individual I just told you about, or we could do it in community workshops, makerspaces, hack labs, tool libraries. Uh, and the paths that you might take through this slide are what I refer to kind of <laughs> opaquely as crypto anarchic fabricative networks, or CAFNs. These are the socio-technological socio trajectories through which illicit data objects are populated, disseminated, and materialized. Uh, and it's important to note here that CAFNs recollect the deep structure of virtual crypto anarchies. We still have a decentralized networking environment, either in your makerspace community or on the internet. There's still the capacity for strong anonymity, and there's still a perceived cost to surveillance. In fact, Disney has about seven cases of litigation against 3D pirates going out right now, um, because apparently its toy figurines are really easy to rip off. So, uh, sorry Disney. This brings us towards a political economics of crypto anarchy. Uh, as CAFNs proliferate, we can expect a few things. Centralized producers of goods in affected industries will have to adapt and enforce their intellectual property rights. If this runs analogously to the record industry, we could expect digital rights management for visibles um, and molecular signatures and watermarks for authenticating finished products. Of course, as we saw with the prostheses, prohibitively expensive goods will be produced at the cost of raw materials. Labor value here is mechanized through the 3D printer, so raw materials are the main consideration. Censorship of certain objects will be impossible. Just like you can't censor uh, digital files in these networks, you can't censor uh, physicals. This kind of harkens back to a cypherpunk debate between whether or not crypto anarchy would look like anarcho-capitalism or some sort of quasi-socialism. Uh, and I think that this binary is a little reductive. The truth is probably that CAFNs will likely challenge and reproduce elements of the economic paradigms in which they're embedded. So a few cautionary notes. These are not a cure-all. For one thing, unsavory devices will be printed, like bomb parts and weapons. Of course, these are already printable on the uh, clear net. Technical expertise, ability, and minimum entrance costs will prevent equal participation. Um, the uh, CompSec and makerspaces tend to be mostly male and white. Uh, and obviously, you've got to have access to a computer. Uh, you've got to be able to have access to a 3D printer. And my hometown of Minneapolis uh, runs about $55 a month for a makerspace membership. So there is some minimum <coughs> entrance to consider. Um, some capitalistic enterprises will benefit. Of course, 3D printing suppliers. You can't 3D print a 3D printer. At least not yet. And uh, luxury brands who manage to sell the real thing. Uh, there's still some aesthetic value to an original as opposed to a counterfeit. 3D printable materials will have an environmental footprint. Most of them at this point are plastics. Uh, and the recyclation processes haven't caught up with the technology. So in conclusion, I argue that CAFNs suggest new methods for a number of things. Activism and hacktivism, corporate sabotage, counterfeiting, uh, evading censorship, and even DIY making and craft projects. The biggest impact may be in countries with strict censorship. Sometimes when we talk about the internet, we ha tend to have a Euro-American focus, but like with WikiLeaks and its counterpart in Eastern Europe, Balkan leaks, um, sometimes countries with the most censorship are the ones that need these censorship-resistant uh, networks the most. So illicit need not connote bad here. States, as well as corporate hegemonies, may prevent people from getting items that crypto anarchies will allow them to access. Um, and of course, 3D printing technologies are still embryonic. Talking about 3D printing today is kind of like Timothy May talking about uh, um, cryptographic tools in the late 80s. We don't know exactly where they're going to go, but I bet we'll be surprised. Uh, then finally, I want to leave you with the final line from the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. Arise, you have nothing to lose but your barbed wire fences. So thank you. And now, Stuart, I think you're up next with uh, What the Hack.
Hi, everybody. I'm Stuart Geiger, and I am uh, and my uh, co-author and lead author on this paper, Brittany Fiore Gartland, unfortunately wasn't able to make it, uh, and so I am presenting sort of on our behalf. Um, and we are presenting the title of our, our project is What the Hack? Hacking Culture and Discourse in Data Science Pedagogy. And someone asked me a question about this title and asked, well, do you mean people who are committing acts of hacking, they are, they are hacking culture and they are hacking discourse with data science, or are you talking about the hacking, uh, you're talking about the cultures of hacking and the discourses of hacking? And my response is, isn't it interesting that that same word can be used in multiple contexts? And that's one of the things that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, now, the project that we are in is part of a collaboration with a bunch of people who are ethnographers in institutes of data science. Um, I'm an ethnographer embedded in the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. Also part of my group is Charlotte Cabas, who uh, is another of my colleagues at, at, at Berkeley at BIDS. Um, Laura Naren is also a ethnographer embedded in the NYU Center for Data Science, and Brittany is at the University of Washington's eScience Institute. And we're all trying to understand what exactly is this data science pheno phenomenon, like what's going on and how is it specifically being introduced into universities. And this is a project, if you want to know, is sort of funded by the, uh, the Moore Foundation, the Sloan Foundation, which is also sort of interested in the role of data science and how it's sort of rising in the university. And we've been taking a very ethnographic approach to understanding what data science is. And one of the things that we've been seeing, though, is not it, it, that's, that's been really productive, is to not sort of start off by asking that question, what is data science, but instead find ways to sort of, from a more ethnographic, descriptive, situated perspective, ask ourselves, what are we seeing in these institutes, and what sort of uh, percolates up? And so one thing that we have been seeing everywhere across, across this is the proliferation of the word hack. And there's just a, couple of, a whole bunch of different ways in which this is being used, and I'll just step through this really quickly. First, you have things like hackathons and hack weeks, um, things like you know, Hack the Commute for Seattle or Science Hack Day, which was across the world. Uh, we had a, you know, a clean web hackathon on clean energy. Um, Astro Hack Week at NYU, Neuro Hack Week at, at University of Washington. Uh, we run an event called The Hacker Within at Berkeley. I ran a session on scraping Wikipedia data. Um, a whole bunch of different things have popped up in this uh, around these sort of institutes and around the data science context. There's also a lot of hacking resources in data science, resources that are branded specifically for hackers, things like O'Reilly's sort of machine learning for hackers book, probabilistic programming and Bayesian methods for hackers, which as you look at the subtitle of this, it says it's an introduction to this particular technique in statistics and machine learning from a computation slash understanding first, mathematics second point of view. And that's something that's interesting I'm gonna come back later to when I talk about how, you, how, so we, so I, how I'm using sort of hacking this way to understand sort of what sort of data science is. Um, there's also things like Hackpad, which is an alternative to Google Docs. It's often used during hackathons. And there's also discourses of hacking that arise in and around data science spaces. Things like Hacker News, which is not exclusively for data science, but something where a lot of data scientists go, and a lot of that news, news takes place. Um, people even sort of write blog posts and think about the future of the university and the role in academia with things like, with, uh, with the term hacking. This is a post um, you know, it's called it's titled Hacking Academia, Data Science in the University. That's interesting by a guy uh, at the University of Washington, Data Science Institute. Um, and then there is this sort of famous, infamous diagram of, of data science skills made by Drew Conway, which has been so influential, famous, and sometimes infamous that it gets its own clean slide. And in it, Drew Conway in 2010 was one of the people who helped coin this term data science and did so with this, this particular Venn diagram, where he identified data science as the intersection of three types of skills. The first is math and statistics skills. The second is substantive expertise or discipline-specific, uh, topic-specific expertise. And the third was this thing called hacking skills. And traditional research was discipline, topic, substantive expertise, plus math and stats knowledge. And what made data science separate, unique, special from traditional research was this thing called hacking skills. And, but if you had hacking skills and substantive ex expertise without math and, math and science knowledge, you're in the danger zone, as you see. <laughs> and so this is something that we really wanted to pick up as ethnographers. So if data science, uh, if hacking skills have the special sauce that makes data science different, than traditional research, what exactly does that look like on the ground? And we've been, uh, and so this is sort of very preliminary work, and I sort of want to note that out front, and these are sort of some things that we're seeing and things that we're thinking about. Um, and I want to sort of tell this story by, by sort of also referencing some previous literature and our sort of approach to thinking about these as sites of education, as pedagogy, and enculturation, rather than simply skills transfer, as they are so often described. So hacking culture and hacking uh, and, and hackathons and this sort of idea is something that sort of began and emerged, sort of really solidified in open source software communities in the 1990s. 
definitely happens before then, for those of you who know the deep, long history of hacking and the hacker movement. But in this caricature, I'm going to describe this. The first hackathon was run by OpenBSD in 1999. This is a t-shirt from a very early, uh, early 2000s hackathon, where it's often framed explicitly as a type of work, get 50 OpenBSD developers in a room full of laptops, and eventually they'll fix every bug in OpenBSD. But this also, the, the image that they use sort of speaks to the fact that this is not just a site for work, it's a site for people who are in the same community, who look very much like each other, who have a common sort of way, you know, they, it's, it's a social activity, it's a social event that's very important for understanding and, and participating and being a member of this very distributed community. And anthropologist uh, Gabriella Coleman in her excellent uh, first book on the Debian community talks about this in almost religious experiences. Um, where, he says, where she says, the joys that hackers derive at these sort of hackathons and these intense events, at times their experience is transcendent and bliss, these sort of all-night coding sessions. After a hackathon, any doubts about one's real connection to virtual projects and relationships are replaced by an invigorated faith to and commitment to this world. And so in this way, so we're seeing sort of hacking events and hacking culture, uh, hackathons and these, these, these related sort of processes as sort of forms of membership, ways of people getting enculturated into a particular community of practice. And that's something that's extended as open source culture, open source software, and things like hackathons have become part of the standard uh, sort of corporate tech industry slate. Just like, um, so with the open source code comes the open source people, comes the open source culture, comes things like hackathons. This is, for example, Facebook's Hacker Square, where the words hacker literally poured into the infrastructure in concrete between the buildings. They run a whole bunch of hackathons and have been one of the sort of biggest hack, hack themed sort of parts of their culture. And Lily, Lily Rani, in a great piece on corporate hackathons and industry-sponsored hackathons, talks about how they are an emblematic site of social practice. Hackathons sometimes produce technologies. They always, however, produce subjects. The hackathon, I mean, what she means by that is that the hackathon rehearses an entrepreneurial citizenship that's very common and very important in the startup culture, in the startup world of Silicon Valley, where you're trying to get, where you're trying to get funding, you come together for a short period of time, and you do the kinds of things that you would do on a more extended timeline if you were actually sort of part of a startup. You work very long hours, it's a sleeping bag culture, you have, a, you have pitches, you, re, you form a team that is the elements that look very similar to the, uh, the, the, the list of employees for a startup. And she argues that these hackathons aren't really about building products, they're about building particular kinds of people. And so we took a very similar kind of frame, theoretical frame, about understanding these as sites of enculturation when looking at this in the data science context. Although I do want to note that hackathons and hack events and other things in the data science world uh, look often very different from the kind of stereotypical hackathons that many of you might be familiar with. I don't really see too much of a sleeping bag culture where people are expected to pull all-nighters. I'm actually very happy about that uh, in certain ways. Uh, but there are some, a lot of issues and similarities, and I'll be talking about that a little bit. So the way that we sort of framing our results and preliminary pre our preliminary findings and sort of uh, steps going forward is thinking about what kinds of work the word hack does in data science. Uh, and we've distinguished it in two levels. One is that hack does kinds of distancing work in academia from traditional academic practices. So in other words, when someone calls something a hack, whenever someone designates a particular event as a hackathon or a hacking space, or a particular room or physical space as a hacking room, whenever someone says they're going to go hacking or they hack something, it does certain kinds of distancing work from more traditional academic practices. <coughs> it also does distinguishing work in academia. It sets that kind of work apart from and sort of uh, uh, apart from other sort of uh, other sort of practices, and I'll explain what I mean by the distinction between these two. So things like distancing work include making room for activities that don't really fit into the average everyday work practices and organizational structures of science. Science is typically sort of uh, has is a very is a centuries old institution, literally a medieval institution, and is one of the things that. Uh, sort of has particular sort of roles and norms and structures and funding models that let particular kinds of work happen. And in a lot of the data science, in a lot of the data science world, there's no, in, 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 sci in, the, in academia, there are not often a lot of spaces for infrastructural work in, ter in terms of spaces for building the necessary tools, maintaining the platforms and infrastructures that are necessary for very large scale scientific collaborations. So often what happens in all of these hackathon events is that it's time for activities that don't really, uh, that, 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 don't, that, that don't get, really get uh, sort of valued at a more traditional institutional level. They're also often, it's, uh, calling things hackathons is also often done to make room for kinds of exploratory or collaborative work that often isn't taught in science education. And this is where the pedagogy, pedagogy part takes place. A lot of hackathons are explicitly built to be educational tra and, and training opportunities. Places where people are, where places where students get together and learn from each other, often people, students from different disciplines to learn about this new thing that everyone's calling data science. Getting people in the same room together and, uh, uh, is, is often, 
And, and, and the reason that these, these hackathons and, and similar kind of events are, are, are being done is because there's a claim that the traditional academic course structure is not moving fast enough in order to incorporate new data science techniques. So that's, that's, and so this is, this is why a lot of the people who are running these events see that these events are, are needed and why this work does, and how this work does it in a particular way. The distinguishing work that, 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 that calling something a hack does often uh, is, is a way that uh, is sort of getting at what I was saying earlier about trying to find out this idea about what data science is. And we find that at a, at a different level, hack imagines common technical activities to different scientific domains. Setting the stage for a universal sort of idea of data science is something where it can be applied to any particular domain. Uh, if you remember that, recall that, that Conway diagram, it's substantive expertise in any particular field. And then it also sort of signals the presence of an expert technical culture, which is something that I, I've been thinking about, about a lot, and a lot of the data scientists also in my field sites and our, in our field sites are also thinking about a lot. The word hack is something that's not exactly the most inclusive uh, term. It often turns, it sort of, sort of it, uh, for a lot of people, it sort of doesn't really bring to mind the, the kind of community that they're used, to do, they're used to thinking about. And so we're thinking about sort of, uh, a lot of people have been experimenting with alternative terms and, and, and other, other aspects like that. And I just want to sort of go, I realize I, did not budget my time wisely. So, I'm, so I have a whole bunch of quotes that sort of make a lot of these points. Uh, and I'll, I'll sort of, I, I won't sort of rush through them, but I'll give just a, a, give, give just, give just a few. Um, one of the things for hack is distancing. Um, one of the things that our, one of our hackathon organizers we interviewed sort of said that uh, whenever he does these things, he explicitly says, don't work on what you would work on during the week. Find something else to work on and maybe you'll learn something. Like try to pick up a tool that you've never used or something. The idea is that the uh, traditional academic structure supports certain kinds of work very well, and so, but, and so hackathons are the kind of things that you couldn't normally do in your work day. That's why there's sort of a special event that's created. Um, and, and then sort of for hack is distancing, we also asked a lot of people at a hackathon, well, what actually is a hack? And the answers that they came with also often had these ideas about exploratory work um, or, or sort of work that sort of might not be things that you would put into a, a paper but are still important to do. Um, often as sort of rapid collaboration. So doing something typically involving computer programming quickly, often as in a rushed or makeshift fashion. Um, and then finally for this quote about sort of imagining common technical problems and activities to all of science, we had a hackathon organizer who told us, I think there's something that happens when you put people together from different disciplines. Suddenly we can abstract away what are common pipelines, common steps. That's real. That's a very serious issue. What are processes and how we're going to share between the fields? Someone else also told me the story of a hacker priest, someone who was an ex-scientist, an excellent hacker, who then left for the ministry, but still did all the kinds of things with sort of wrote all their sermons in a sort of scientific markdown language, yeah, used sort of GitHub to do it, automated the creation of their bulletin. And so the idea is that not, not even, not, it's not even universal to science, but universal to potentially all kinds of activities. And I want to conclude by showing this slide from an anonymous Code for Lib presentation about sort of things about diversity and inclusion, where they, they uh, at NCSU, they sort of changed the name of what they called the same, the exact same event. Uh, create a coding workshop with 70% female, over 50% humanities and design. A creative coding hackathon with 90% male, 80% computer science. A creative coding lunch group was 50-50. Now they noted that this was not a controlled experiment, but something that we've been thinking about a lot about how to sort of uh, uh, think about this in terms of hacking culture and discourse. Thank you very much. Laura, do you have a PowerPoint? Sure. Okay. Whoa. Whoa. Um, next is Laura Nareen. Quitting toxic open source communities towards a theory of disengagement among regular open source contributors. That's really all I have to contribute to the introduction of your of your presentation, but I see you have it open there, so. Oh, do you have it open? Um, so, so far we have themes emerging around, um, you know, the ways in which these different kinds of <coughs> technical processes or, um, or collaborative technical processes produce different kinds of subjectivities and socialities. <coughs> um, and we're not so much uh, hacking the planet in order to in order to solve the problems of the planet, but more in terms of like creating different social arrangements around it. So that's sort of an interesting common thread that's beginning to emerge. Another is that um, proprietary technologies such as Keynote <laughs> can, be, can be frustrating. Really, you should have just hand-coded an HTML page with a list of links. Um, it's a Well, but then you'll need to, 
So we're going to run software update. <laughs> it's sort of a, are we, can we do this in the background though while the next presentation is happening? Or is it going to? Why don't you try and um, go find the computer? Do you have it on a, a USB key or something? I do, but I, I that's you have the your one own I computer? loaded on there. Okay, you, you get ready on your own computer, and we'll switch computers in a moment. And for now, we'll go to the fourth presentation and come back to the third. Perfect. Okay. I so think uh, PowerPoint should work for mine. I had a did not do those. So Microsoft we'll PowerPoint. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Emma Stam, block party people off the Bitcoin chain. All right. <laughs> That's a great title. I hope so. Is it on the USB? Uh, <laughs> You can start talking about it. Here we go. All right, perfect. <laughs> and then a little bit shorter. Hey, everybody. All right. Uh, technical difficulties aside, uh, this is a talk about blockchain technology. And I'm going to try to uh, give as non abstruse a definition and talk as I can dealing with this subject. Um, I was introduced to the concept of blockchain technology this past fall, and though I didn't understand how it worked right off the bat, I took an interest in it anyway. I'm a long-standing advocate for open source, and blockchain is often described as distributed, decentralized, transparent, and peer-to-peer. -peer. All of these words were music to my open source loving ears, so I decided to learn more about it. Great. Like many other researchers, my interest in blockchain tech has grown quite a lot very recently. As I've been educating myself about the technical particulars, I've come to realize that we need to talk about how it's being discussed in the media and the general <coughs> message that we're sending about blockchain. I'd like to suggest that when it comes to the way we report on it, whether in tech industry publications or more general interest media outlets, there are a lot of social concerns that deserve to be brought to light. But before I get ahead of myself, what is a blockchain? I'm sure a lot of people here have heard of the term, um, but it still may seem a bit foreign or complicated. So I will first say a few words about what blockchain is not. Blockchain is not Bitcoin. Uh, it was developed in order to make Bitcoin possible, but the two should not be confused with one another. When people use the word blockchain, they may be referring to the specific blockchain that Bitcoin uses or another blockchain. Uh, the Bitcoin blockchain is far from the only one. As for what it is, blockchain is a structure at its core. It's just a tool for the transmission of data. This data can be in the form of a cryptocurrency token, like a Bitcoin, a text document, an audio file, um, pretty much anything that data can be. When a piece of data is entered onto a blockchain, all of the computers that are part of that blockchain's network validate the fact that it's there. This validation process happens using an algorithm that creates a piece of cryptographic information known as a hash or a proof of work. The original piece of data that was entered onto the chain plus the hash or proof of work together that was produced during the validation process together create what's known as a block. Every time that piece of data moves to another party, like when someone makes a payment using Bitcoin, a new hash is generated based on the prior hash and therefore a new block is created. The series of blocks together forms the chain. The validation process also makes it hard for data to be copied as it moves along the chain. So like, when I send you an email with a photo file attached that I take from my desktop, what I send to you is a copy. The photo doesn't disappear from the desktop. 
Uh, with a blockchain, what moves is the original piece of data, not a copy of the data. A really important feature of blockchain also is that every computer on a particular chain can see everything that's ever happened on the chain. So every time a piece of data is transferred, there is an immutable record of it made. This is why blockchain is sometimes described as a distributed ledger. It's a record of digital transfers that everyone on its network has access to and can audit. So that's actually a really simple explanation. There's a lot more to it than that. But the big takeaways are that data can't be copied as it moves along a blockchain. Everything that's recorded on a blockchain is completely permanent. And everybody that's on the blockchain's network can go back and audit everything that's ever happened on it. As you would imagine, because this structure was developed for Bitcoin, it lends itself particularly well to electronic currency transactions. It helps to streamline a lot of complexities of financial technology and disintermediate or cut out intermediary structures that can make digital finance costly and inefficient. However, finance is far from the only use case for blockchain. It can be used to assist with everything from voting to verifying identity to selling content online. I will refrain from using the word disruptive, <laughs> but the potential for blockchain is theoretically only limited by what can be accomplished over any digital network. So even though blockchain technology has been around since at least 2008, when Satoshi Nakamoto first proposed Bitcoin, discussions of blockchain without Bitcoin have been infrequent until very recently. In the last year, there's been an explosion of interest in blockchain. Most of this interest has come from global banks and financial institutions who recognize its potential for financial technology. For example, IBM is investing heavily in blockchains and is working with the Linux Foundation on something called the Hyperledger Project, which is a broad scale, completely open source initiative for developing enterprise level blockchain solutions, basically all for big business. Companies investing in this include JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Hitachi, and Intel, along with a number of VC-backed blockchain-specific startups. Most media attention on blockchain is geared toward this particular community. Indeed, internet technologies in their earliest stages have historically been reported on in terms that are designed to appeal to their developers and early adopters. In other words, those with a lot of professional power, money, and intellectual access. This is by its very nature a narrow group, particularly where early adoption is concerned. It entails a huge amount of financial power along with other forms of privilege. Of course, there are plenty of reasons to target specific audiences when writing about new technologies. One is comprehensibility. When a tool is in its earliest stages of development, layman's terms and easily understandable use cases have yet to materialize. As a general rule, the appropriate metaphors only emerge after this new tool has been out in the real world for a little while. But those interested in learning about new technologies in non-layman's terms, the ones who want to pore over dense jargon-filled texts and abstraction-heavy descriptions, or are just really keen to become part of the discussion when it's in its earliest phases, aren't always professionals, and they're not necessarily in the financial situation to become early adopters. They also don't always fit the stereotypical image of the ahead of the tech curve set. Sometimes they're female. Sometimes they haven't gone to college. Sometimes they live far away from a major city or coastal area and all of the cultural access that comes with that. That doesn't mean that these individuals wouldn't have anything important to offer to the conversation about a tool like blockchain. And in fact, they may be the very ones who can help ensure that it's developed in a way now so that it can benefit as many people as possible in the future. One of the ways in which the conversation around blockchain is being slanted toward a very particular mindset is the use of the word trustless. Blockchain is often called a trustless technology or one that reduces the need for trust due to its technical protocol. I see some problems with this descriptor. It implies that trust is a bad thing that more perfect systems, whether they be technical or governmental or what have you, eliminate the need for trust. <coughs> but trust is our emotional connection to risk. And the way that we talk about trust says a lot about our relationships to the systems that we build as well as to each other. I personally think that de-emphasizing the need for trust is misguided. 
but I also don't really think that blockchain should be called a trustless technology to begin with. Another way of talking about it would be to say that it can and should increase our sense of trust. For example, if you engineer a bridge in a way that makes it more safe for car traffic, and you explain to drivers how it works with as much detail as they may want, you have not created a trustless bridge. What you've created is a bridge that increases the driver's sense of trust in their own action of driving the car over it. Uh, now, I think that this is a fitting analogy because, in a sense, blockchain can't raise your level of trust in other people, like what other people <coughs> on the chain are doing with your data. Much in the same way that a safer bridge doesn't necessarily mean that other drivers on the road are going to act more responsibly. But the structure itself is more trustworthy. We can create systems that are more secure, in part because they're more open and we can understand how they work. This is kind of the soul and essence of open source. In the case of blockchain, it's more transparent than older structures that would be holding on to our data, like a bank or a closed source online network. Uh, we can see everything happening on it. So even though it's just a semantic distinction, the frequent reference to blockchain as a trustless technology smacks of a certain techno-utopianism. And it can leave people feeling really intimidated by it, I think. Um, so it's one case in which the message being sent about blockchain, I think, should be re-examined. Also, there's a lot of attention being given to the argument that blockchain can't exist without Bitcoin or that a financial incentive in general is necessary for people to keep making new blocks on the chain, to keep transferring data along it. I don't think that we should be encouraging this. On one hand, there are already billions of dollars being invested in blockchains that may not come to carry finance-related data. Um, on another hand, it's new and experimental, so we shouldn't constrain our imagination about it. Um, so I'm gonna skip over some other sort of stuff. I've got two minutes here. It can be used for permanent messaging. Um, I'm going to talk about some cooler applications of blockchain these last minutes. This is uh, from an application that I have on my phone uh, called Eternity Wall. People will put messages onto it that can never be erased. So there's a lot of things that are random thoughts, blockchain politics. People think it's romantic to declare their love on a blockchain since the data can never be erased. I've also heard of blockchain applications for voting so that votes can all be audited. Um, for disaster relief funding, which is historically a high-risk charitable donation case, since it's more auditable, it's really great for that. Um, social media on a blockchain to authenticate your identity. Microfinance, because blockchains um, cut out the cost associated with digital transfers, so sending small amounts of money is actually much easier and more efficient on a blockchain. <coughs> I personally think it would be great to do uh, a WikiLeaks style leaked document um, transfer system on a blockchain. It would be amazing for authenticating leaked documents. This is not a real thing, this is just an idea that I have. Uh, I hope the FBI isn't listening to me right now, but uh, WikiChain, I think it'd be a cool idea. So in closing, um, I just wanna say that I discovered blockchain as I was feeling extremely pessimistic about the future of the internet. I saw it turning into what I thought was a monolithic structure controlled by a handful of corporations and in my very low moments, its total commodification seemed inescapable to me. But um, if we're gonna keep the internet as open and as awesome as possible, we really do need to address it, not just from a social but also a technical perspective to really get into the heart of the code itself. Blockchain offers a really great solution to a lot of its problems today. So for people who may not think of themselves as wanting to get in on something like this, I say that right now, while we're beginning to develop the standards for it, is the time for all, everybody in every community to look at it. All right, thanks. Okay. Um, I am. Um, Yes, yeah, so there's uh, interesting themes emerging around um, what sort of social groups have access to um, the kind of activities happening around these technologies. And I think blockchain is a really interesting example of something which is like purportedly open, but which has all these sort of barriers. And you know, there's the barrier of early adoption, being part of the privileged few who have the early information. There's the barrier of just the word blockchain um, or the word Bitcoin, which people are um, 
are sort of uh, you know hesitant about it, and they don't think it applies to them. And I, I, I thought your presentation was an interesting counterpoint to people that might have those thoughts of being afraid to have access. But now, here's a very different thought around access, uh, quitting open source communities. Thanks so much. Thanks for being patient um, when we get the slides going here. Um, Since you're wrapped around that. All right, so I am, I also work in the same kind of environment that Stuart works in, except that I'm at NYU and he's at Berkeley. So I'm gonna thank our funders, the Moore and Sloan Foundations, and I also wanna make a little bit of a kind of a fine print note. All of the quotes in here that are only one name, if it's like Jack or Jonathan, those are anonymized, and I've tried to kind of slightly change the words in some of the quotes so that you can't Google them because some of them were taken from comments or from blog posts so that if you really just Google them, you could get back to their real names. So I, I did that. So they're not perfect, perfect quotes, but they pretty much maintain the, the attitude of the, of the words that were originally there. And people who are quoted with both their names, that is taken from something that was public. So you can look that up. All right, so we all know that open source communities are voluntary, right? You don't have to participate in open source. It's something that you want to do, and you usually don't get paid for doing it, usually, but some people do. Um, with any voluntary community, people quit. If you don't have to do it, you could quit. Even if you do have to do something, you can still quit. Uh, this is kind of a known issue in open source communities. Um, some of the more kind of interesting language used around it. Um, the communities themselves, kind of an informal way to assess your community is the bus factor, which is how many people could get hit by a bus and your community would not collapse. Um, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty macho kind of way to describe the inclusiveness or the stickiness of a community, and I, I picked that particular mechanism for describing it so that you get a sense that some of these communities are they're they're kind of they're really interested <coughs> in having survivors and they and even with Stuart's talk when he's talking about hacks, the idea that you're supposed to stay up all night um, and sort of survive through till you can produce this m amazing thing in twenty four hours or forty eight hours. There is a certain sense of survivorship in these communities that tends to downplay um, certain types of complaints. Some kinds of complaints in these communities are acceptable. Like if you're not technically doing something correctly, it's okay that someone else might complain about your um, lack of technical sophistication. If you're a new person and you haven't read the appropriate documentation first, it's okay to complain about that. But there are other kinds of things that are a little harder for people to complain about. Um, so what I was really interested in finding out is why people quit and how they quit. Do they just fade? Do they make public statements? Do they try to remain engaged and then kind of give up? And I'm particularly interested in this because I am doing ethnography in a center for data science. And a lot of the stuff that we're asking some of the data scientists to do are also these kinds of voluntary things. Like, please teach your you know, colleagues in some other discipline how to do data science. Well, they're not really gonna get paid for that. Um, they, they may be initially excited and then it turns out to really take a lot of time. So I'm kind of interested in learning from open source communities because data science is turning out to replicate a lot of the kinds of expectations of volunteerism and technical expertise. Uh, so here's a fairly typical kind of, occasionally people do post their quitting stories and I've, I've read tons and tons of quitting stories. Um, so this is from, an open source, not quitter, but, but fader. He fades in and out. So he says, dealing with open source is an emotional heavy job, and one way I and many others deal with it is by closing up. I've started silencing GitHub emails. I can't handle the flow. Contributors don't have limitless attention or infinite time. Um, so that was Jack, and this is what Jack's GitHub contributions look like. So if you've never seen GitHub, GitHub keeps a kind of an ongoing calendar of all of your contributions. One contribution per day will get you this kind of light yellow or light green square, and then the darker it gets, the more contributions you were making that day. So this, this particular contributor is extremely active on GitHub. 5,000 contributions in a year is a lot of contributions to open source. I mean, I can see some of you laughing. It's ridiculous. Um, but you can see that he did kind of have some fading. As it gets towards the end of the year, you know, 
we're not really sure what happened there, but at least on GitHub you can see that he's fading. For an open source person, that might be kind of an embarrassing, like, oh, whoops, like, you can see my contributions have declined. And even this affordance itself kind of encourages you to contribute for long periods of time. They record your total commits in the last year, the number of days that you've made a, com like, the streak that you've gone on com committing at least once a day. Um, and he posted this along with his commentary, so you can see at that particular point in time he had not been <coughs> contributing because he's got a zero-day streak going there. Um, so we can, I can't help, I'm an academic, I can't help but look at the literature and see, okay, well, teams are not new. Teams are actually really hot right now. So what does management literature say about this? Well, we should be somewhat comforted by the fact that this happens in real organizations too. Um, 20 to 25% to 35% of the value-added collaborations are coming from only 3 to 5% of the employees. So the idea that open source is making all this software and all these tools that are being used by so many people, but only a very few are really making value-added contributions, that's pretty common. So open source isn't so different than what you'd find in an organization. But open source people don't get paid, and they don't go to work in a job where they're surrounded by their colleagues all the time, and they don't have kind of a, an expectation that you do your work for these hours and then you can sort of be less active after work. Um, so some of the management literature is great, but the solutions that they tend to propose are things that are really hard to do in open source. So for this kind of problem, they recommended that you do a 360 degree survey and figure out who's actually contributing the most. Well, GitHub already kind of knows who's <coughs> contributing the most. And then reduce the collaboration expectations on those people which you can, in an open source, like how are you supposed to, it doesn't really map to the terrain very well. Um, so I'm gonna focus, there are many known issues in open source and just in the interest of time, I'm gonna focus on the two that I have the most to say about. So one known issue is that open source is often unpaid. Um, and this comes up you, as people are describing fading their fades or sort of rationalizing, I'm gonna fade out now because I'm not being paid for this um, this is quality time I could be spending with my wife and kids or writing. It's not fair to expect me to do even more work beyond my job and get no compensation in time or dollars. And this happens fairly, fairly often among people who have been contributing for a long period of time. And one of the things I was seeing a lot is that as people's work life open source balance starts to have more real constraints on the life side, like kids or a marriage, those are times when, when people start to kind of use this economic rationalization, often probably because it, it costs money to support kids and to do things like pay your mortgage. So they're all kind of related, and it seemed like this type of triangle, work life, open source, was a problem the more you had in the life department, or the more you had in the work department. If you don't have a job, you just have life in open source. If you don't have so many constraints on your life component, then you might just have work in open source. But for people who had the whole triangle, this was a real problem. And justifying fading out because you're not getting paid um, came up a lot. So we'll come back to that in a second. Um, but getting paid isn't really the, f the full story. Part of, the, part of what I heard a lot was that these, the platforms for accepting requests to do something are always on, and they make it very, very easy for people to ask for help. Hey, can you, can you have your package do this for me? Can you add it? Can you make this plugin work with your software? Um, and people were aware that they've got emails for requests that are sitting there just piling up, and they're feeling guilty. This idea of feeling guilty was the single most common emotion that or justification that I saw in my sample, just guilt, 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 guilt. So that really has nothing to do with getting paid or not getting paid. It's just kind of an emotional reaction to the idea that all these requests are piling up. And so I had a story from one guy who was like, oh, this, I'm trying to write a book, so I've decided to scale back on my open source time, but I know that a student made a really excellent contribution and it has been sitting there for four months because I don't have time to review it. And that feels bad, I feel bad, but it must feel really bad for him too, that he did this great thing and it's just been sitting there for four months. 
So that's a fairly typical situation that comes up. So what could we possibly do about it? Well, what if you just did open source as a job? And I bring this up because our grant makers are kind of interested in this question. Could they fund some open source contributors if we know that you know, three to five percent of the members in a community are really making the biggest impact? What if we just paid those people and this was just their job? Um, and I did. I was able to interview some people who, who have that situation, and it helps. Um, so one of the things that helps, it wasn't that he was like, great, now I can finally afford the pizza um, or you know, the rent. It was, now I just don't have to do this stuff after hours. And he, as he was interviewing with me, he said, oh, I work on open source stuff on the weekends, but, and then he thought about it for a second, actually, it's not the first thing I do in the morning anymore. I usually start working on it when I come into the office. I feel it helps me get a much better balance. Um, so yeah, maybe this is a solution, but I think short of our funders being interested in this, it's, it's not that common to have someone be able to do true open source stuff. Um, maybe you could work on open source that's specifically related to your company, but this particular person was allowed to kind of do whatever in open source uh, you would have done otherwise. So whatever is interesting to Jonathan is what was getting done in those communities. So that could help, but it seems really limited. Um, and this might, it might not so much be getting paid, but it might be the fact that he c knows when he can turn things off that reduces his feelings of guilt. Um, what about new affordances? So I'm all about the socio-technical. A lot of people specifically complained about GitHub. I know that if you were in the open source community, you might say, oh, there are some affordances. Look, we have these readmes. And then GitHub will just actually go ahead and d distill your readme into something nice to look at. Here, you can teach people how to be in your open source community. Um, but those aren't really enough. So uh, kind of an emeritus Linux developer, Sarah Stone, has a great blog post on how to run open source communities. She wasn't really thinking of affordances, but she pointed out that basic human decency and empathy and awareness are things you actually have to work on, which I'm bringing up not because I think it surprises you, but I think it's surprising to hear someone have to point out that these things need to be included in any kind of community. Um, because this is something I'm still working on, I, uh, and I've heard this from elsewhere in our data science environment, that a lot of people are also concerned that they're not there's no way to indicate gratitude, really. So you saw you could see how many contributions people were making, but there's no way for someone to just say, man, that really helped me solve this huge problem I was having, um, or just that helped me a little bit. There's no real way to do that with these affordances, and that might help a lot um, to balance out the guilty feelings. Um, there's also no affordances that recognize the patience of the requesters, like, oh, hey, thanks for waiting. It's been four months, but we're, you know, we haven't forgotten about you. Um, and the other thing that really seemed to come up as a problem in these situations that I'm still working on is synchronicity. So the four month thing is a problem, but if the student knew that, oh, well, I'm writing this book that you'll be able to read that will teach you way more than what I can sort of help you do or help one person do in, in, my, in my role as a developer, that might somehow help people understand what they're waiting for and reduce the feelings of anger, because you do get a lot of commenters who are simply just angry in open source communities. So this is ongoing work, and I'm going to use this as a, a moment. If you are a contributor to open source and you would like to talk to me <laughs> about quitting or fading, I am definitely interested um, in talking to people about their experiences in open source around quitting and fading. And that's all I got. Great. I think everyone, maybe if we can sit at the table for the Q&A. Um, I'll try and drag the microphone over without knocking things down. And we need one more chair. I'm going to grab this one. Um, five minutes. Um, would you give me my program? Um, so. Uh, those were um, four really interesting discussions of um, communities that 
produce things, or blockchain produces the blockchain, I guess. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> Proof <true>. of <laughs> work. Um, maybe let's start by going back to the first presentation because I, th I think that um, there was something in the presentation that I think one of the things you were kind of arguing, uh, Tyler, was that just the, there was a sense that like what what differed most from the general model of a crypto anarchic community, uh, the May model with um, 3D printing was the fact that material objects were produced. Mm -hmm. um, is Was that, did I like project that interpretation onto you? Um, or is that kind of a valid idea to have drawn from it? Sure. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a component of it. I'm a little trapped in the, the binary that tends to come up in STS discourse between virtuality and materiality. Um, I think it's reductive. So there, there's a <coughs> there's a point at which it's worth it's worthwhile to point out that something like a, a blockchain um, is still a material entity. It's electronic um, and it has a physical existence that often I is really important to consider when you're analyzing these sorts of things. But but I do want to point out that. Um, in the way that we tend to think about virtuality as at least contained on the internet. Uh, this is something that 3D printing allows us to sort of get outside of. So with 3D printing, we have these digital objects, physibles, um, which can actually be reified into tangible 3D objects. And this opens up, um, this opens up the world of crypto anarchy to the physical world, um, where now we can print things like prostheses, uh, replacement components for vehicles, um, or wheelchairs or any number of things. So I, I, I think that you're hitting on that. I, I think in a way it's like somehow the object that gets 3D printed is no longer, its value is no longer just in the information, but in the manufacturing of it. Whereas the blockchain, when it's manufactured, the value is still somehow only in the information or, um, I mean, the, the yeah. Um, I, I think so. Um, I mean, the blockchain and, you know, Bitcoin conversations around both refer to it as the internet of money or the internet of value. Um, as far as, you know, what I was speaking about is concerned, uh, I think value can be in the form of financial value, like with cryptocurrency or um, data value content that just has intrinsic value or something like that. But um, yeah, uh, the, the value of it, of it is you can't um, really extricate the data that's on a blockchain from the chain itself. So yeah, but maybe maybe exchange value and use value are in a, inexact, but somehow along the right lines. But I thought one of the interesting things in your presentation, Emma, was the kind of a call to get involved in this discussion of shaping the affordances of the blockchain. So um, I think the thing that kind of was implicit in your presentation, Stuart, or your paper, was the you know, there was something that you were kind of going for with the study of hacking culture. Like there was an ethical reference and you were presenting it in a semi-neutral way for the most part. You know, this is what happens when you do this. But I think that I'd like you to say like, what is your goal for what hack hacking culture could produce in terms of a different kind of subjectivity or social formation than what we are getting from it now? Not hacker culture, but these hacks within the academic world. Yeah, I mean, I am an ethnographer and also very new to this field site. I started in, in officially in January, and so I do sort of strive to be sort of very, very descriptive, especially at this stage. Uh, but I'm also a participant observer in this space as well. Like, I help run the hacker within, uh, within someone else at our Data Science Institute. Um, and I think that it's, I guess my goal would be to, from a more ethical thing, I, I do see a lot of the um, creative, collaborator, collaborative sort of potential of a lot of these uh, things that are signified by hacking discourse and, and hacking culture. Uh, and I think, you know, I think open source software has produced a whole lot and it coming more into academia is bringing a lot of benefits. Uh, I do think it's sort of what I concluded on though with like this, these issues of inclusion and diversity or something that's, that's really important to me and, and also really important to a lot of the data scientists at Berkeley too, which is something I'm, I'm really happy about. And so I think well, a lot of us are sort of working together to sort of think about um, how do we sort of make data science into the kind of thing that is uh, more inclusive per than sort of computer science and, and other sort of things that are often closely associated with it. So as this discipline or as this field or, or whatever data science sort of is ontologically starts to become a thing, like how do we make it into the into the kind of inclusive practice that, that can include uh, people from all across campus and people from who from various <coughs> backgrounds uh, will feel comfortable sort of joining and participating in this. So I think that's interesting because there's, you know, there's 
the ethical reference is about yeah, democracy, participation, access for people. And I wanted to ask Laura if that sort of is different than the direction you're pushing things in by rewarding the most senior contributors to a community. Yeah, actually, I, so on, on Stuart's question of being inclusive, I'm a little bit worried that the people who get to be most included are the, the people who we then ask to do the most work. So I'm actually kind of res responding a little bit to like, well, what happens if you set up an informal culture and then through that culture you expect certain types of contributions? And I am seeing a little bit of burnout on some of out, like the, the people in our space who are doing a lot of open source contributing, which could be open science or it could be data science. Um, but yeah, I am kind of on the other side of like, well, what happens if everyone's invited, but it's all very informal? You're still probably going to see that kind of situation where you've got extra milers who do a lot of the work and may or may not find a way to be rewarded for it, whether explicitly or not. Um, and there is kind of a heroic attitude, like if you push back, you're asked, well, did you, did you pull an all-nighter last week? Because I did. So hierarchy isn't exactly the enemy, and there's labor is a more important theme in that work. Um, I wanted to open it up. Has anyone been following on Twitter that has seen interesting points there they wanted to share with the group or questions from the, from the audience? So I, I didn't go at it directly from addiction, but I did go at it from like, well, is there something about a personality that would, like a type of person who, who gets a lot of benefit from being altruistic, would then also get kind of burnt out because they're looking for that type of, like, okay, hey, I did this great stuff, and now I'm looking for like the thanks, and I don't get it. And uh, when I brought that up in interviews, it was very unpopular. That the people do not want to talk about that, although, like three or four questions later, they might be say something like, oh, and by the way, I don't think I could do any of this work without you know, the drugs I take for the mental health issues that I have. So I don't, you know, I'm, I'm working on that, but it, it's a little bit, it's really touchy and it's, it's hard to get to, to the bottom of that. Um, feel free to, to raise hands at any moment, but I, I just, yeah, the, I thought the psychoanalytic sort of potential of the research was interesting. Like, what gets produced in the open source community seems to be guilt for a, you know, a small part. But I think that um, I, I do think that the, that the economic aspect of it is super crucial. Um, I thought that could be a good moment to bring it back to you because in a way you're arguing for financial compensation for something that now exists as a non-renumerated practice for the most part. Whereas you were arguing for the uh, removal of an economic incentive from the proof of work that blockchain requires mm -hmm. as a basis for the whole community. Um, how do you see that working? You know, doesn't it just lead to similar kinds of issues? Of people you know, shouldering too much of a burden in order to keep the whole thing running? Uh, yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting to see as blockchain moves forward. Um, Right now, with the blockchain applications that are out there being tested, you don't necessarily need to actually um, really do work to create a new block. You know, sending a message like the ones that I showed is that will create a, a new block. But then, in the long run, all of this will have to ha be funded in some way. Um, so it may come to be that most of what happens on a blockchain to create them is somehow related to financial transactions. Um, or that, I'm, for example, on that messaging app that I showed you guys, in order to uh, become anonymous on that application, you actually have to spend money. So I haven't used it very much because then all my information gets out there. So um, those are our crucial issues. Um, but again, it's, it's a little bit too early to see how that'll play out. Um, we're right at the end. So one last question or point, for, or I guess question. I'm supposed to ask you to phrase things as questions, not as <laughs> my research is about. 
last points. I, um, I think it's it's one fifteen, and I'm told that we always stay on time at theorizing the web. So I want to say thank you to all of you for coming. Thanks especially to my wife Ava for coming. Hi. <laughs> and thank you to our esteemed panelists.